I'm Jack Rustin, welcome to Rustin's Boneyard. January is a month of belt tightening in more ways than one, that Christmas piper has to be paid. And so this month we're looking at some more affordable recipes. We have the chili chuck roast, we have the pork ragu with eggs, they're awesome, check them out. Today it's the turn of the Boneyard meatloaf. And it's apposite because meatloaf, the artist, died today very sadly, and I hope I can do him justice with the Boneyard meatloaf. Now, where to begin? First things first, we're gonna chop an onion, about one large onion. If you can only get smaller ones, do a couple. Here we go, we've got some melting tallow here and we're just gonna pop our onion in there to soften. It's okay for this recipe if you do get a little bit of color on it, some slight browning, some slight caramelization, that's okay. That can go back on our heat. And now we're gonna add these three fat cloves of garlic and what we're gonna do is just crush. Sometimes they start to sprout in the middle and you get this root, here it is. And that is bitter. So get rid of that, finely chop the garlic. Now if you've got a crusher, by all means crush it, it's absolutely fine. So while I'm prepping my other bits here and listening to the onion, I can tell by whether it's just a gentle hiss or whether I'm hearing a sizzle, I can tell how fast it's going. So I'm tuning in to what it's doing over there on the hob and I can smell to a certain degree as well if it's going to start getting too hot. And it's really important to try to tune into these kind of senses as a cook. You know, we, we, we can't keep our eye on everything all the time. And here we go with our finely chopped garlic, just in with the onion. Now I'm gonna add to this some dried herbs. And to some extent, you can kind of use what you can find in the cupboard, but I'm gonna go for oregano, plenty of dried oregano. And I've also got some sage here. Just gonna go in. There we go. And we'll just pop this back on the heat. Why am I cooking the onion and garlic in advance? Why, why am I not just gonna mix these raw with the meat? One of the reasons why onion and garlic are, are good for us is because they have this sulfur content, this, this, this precursor to glutathione, which is our kind of master antioxidant. That sort of sulfurous edge seems to come out into the meat. If we soften it first in the pan, we're gonna lose that. So what I've got is some chuck here from my butcher. This is nice um, beef chuck. I like to grind it myself. I think there's a texture upgrade when you grind meat immediately before you use it. Can you use cheap mints from the supermarket? I went to my local supermarket and I found the cheapest 20% fat ground beef. They came back, they said, no, it's simply fatty trimmings of beef. Uh, we don't use organs in it, we don't use ammonia, we don't use sterilizing agents. So I think you could be pretty confident to eat that beef. Now, it's not going to be grass-fed at that price. Does that matter? The argument for grass-fed beef is that the fat contains a greater quantity of omega-3 fats, anti-inflammatory, as opposed to inflammatory omega-6 fats. Now, in all honesty, the difference between these two in a cow uh, you know, which is not a monogastric animal like a pig or a chicken or a human, which stores the fat that it eats in the form that it eats them. A cow makes uh, uh, saturated fat out of unsaturated fat. So, you know, the difference between the fat profile in those animals is actually minor. And most grain-fed cows spend almost their entire life on pasture anyway. So, uh, does this make a difference? Well, a tiny bit. But if you put even a tablespoon of olive oil in your food, then you've, 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 you've readjusted that omega-6 to omega-3 balance anyway in the favor of omega-6. So, you know, honestly, if you're trying to eat on a budget, I wouldn't get too caught up in the grass-fed meat thing. I wouldn't be too afraid of uh, the cheap mints in the supermarket. That said, it's worth emailing your supermarket and asking them what they put in their mints, because it may vary. Uh, the one I was talking about was Waitrose here in the UK. So I've got this chuck. This is actually from my local butcher. It's a reasonably cheap cut, even from the butcher. And I'm gonna grind this down. There we go, look, we've got our beautiful chuck. Now, the onions. Now these are just starting to take on a tiny bit of color now. They're translucent, 
smelling nice. I can just leave these on one side to cool down. I've got some smoked streaky bacon. And what we're gonna do is we're just gonna trim the rind off, keeping the fat if I can. Now, you know, this is gonna add a lovely smoky flavor. But again, bacon, uh, most people think of, of pork fat as being a saturated fat. It's not, it's actually largely monounsaturated, but it also contains polyunsaturated fat, a lot of which is gonna be omega-6. You know, we don't feed pigs really what they're supposed to eat, which is acorns and stuff like that. They tend to get fed soy and corn and, and other sort of agricultural waste products, basically, that can't go into the human food chain. So their fat, being a monogastric animal, their fat contains those omega-6 fats. So, you know, it can get incredibly fussy about our grass-fed beef, um, but then, you know, the moment we put a bit of bacon in, we're just simply adding omega-6 fats anyway. So, you know, if you're very concerned about all that stuff, don't use the bacon, but, uh, you know, it adds a nice smoky uh, quality and really there's very little of it. Now, I'm using four rashers here, but just, you know, don't, don't be too caught up in the exact quantities of all of these things. To some extent, we just have to develop the ability to judge things by eye and also sometimes to just use what we've got. I mean, if you've got a bit of bacon in the fridge, chuck it in. If you haven't and you don't want to go shopping, don't worry about it. It's not like baking, where if you get things a tiny bit wrong, you know, the whole science experiment collapses. So I've just really finely diced this bacon now. And into our bowl, we're gonna pop a couple of eggs. And I'm just gonna beat those together with a fork. And into there, we're gonna pop our bacon and our beef. And a really good seasoning of salt. Now, I can't tell you exactly how much salt to use, because it's gonna depend on your salt, on how fine it is, uh, on how sort of salty it is, because they do vary a bit. And I've got molden salt here, which is a flaked salt. And uh, so, because there's more sort of air around those big flakes, I'm gonna need visually more to get the same actual amount of salt uh, as if it was a gr finely ground salt. Uh, like Redmond or, or table salt, but I'm putting quite a lot in. You know, if, if we don't season this enough, what's gonna happen is it's gonna be very sort of flat tasting, very bland. Now if you're carnivore, at this point, skip forward to the point where we add the beef protein. If not, continue. We are gonna add about a tablespoon of tomato concentrate. It, it allows for a slight sort of caramelization on the surface and a kind of background umami flavor. Dijon mustard, and we're gonna add kind of a heat teaspoon. And this again is all about the kind of background flavor. If we put this in, we're, we're getting a slight acidity. And that, that's, that sort of opens up our taste buds and it brings in the other flavors. Now I really like this one, the Mutar de Mai. I know this is a more affordable recipe and this is not the cheapest mustard you can get, but get a big pot of this, it'll last a long time. It is the best Dijon. To this, we're just gonna add these onions and garlic, which we've allowed to cool. We've got our herbs in there. We're just gonna bring them in on top here. And then what we're gonna do is just start to combine all this. It's all very kind of gloopy and wet feeling from that egg, but as you continue to blend it, it'll incorporate and the whole thing will dry out in your hands to some degree. So what we're gonna do is just mix it until we hit that point. So now with clean hands, a little handful of this beef protein isolate. Sprinkle it, I'm gonna try not to let it clump anywhere and I'm gonna keep turning it over with my other hand. And the reason I don't just dump a big lump of it over and then start mixing it is that it will tend to then immediately clump together and it'll be hard to mix it through. It's gonna allow the thing to kind of hang together in a way that it wouldn't normally do without breadcrumbs in it. And it will literally glue itself to your hands and it will be all a bit of a mess, but don't worry, just get amongst it. And I'm gonna pop it into my loaf tin, in inverted commas, it's actually a silicon 
mould. I'm not worried if it sticks up over the top, that's all good. We can just shape this, slightly kind of slap it down, get it to sort of press itself into the mould, into a bain marie. Now, what is a bain marie? It's just a bowl of water which we're going to put in the oven. So this goes inside this casserole like this. And then I'm going to pour hot water from my kettle around the outside. And why use a bain marie? Well, you don't have to, in all honesty. You could just put the mould straight into the oven. But what this does is that it allows a more even cooking, a more even transfer of heat into the meatloaf. And it seems to make it a little more tender, a little more moist. And this whole lot is going to go into a 170 degree centigrade oven, which is about 340, 335, 340 Fahrenheit. So it's going to go in there for two hours. Okie dokie, look at this. It's looking absolutely glorious. 20 minutes, half an hour before that two hour cooking time is up. What we want to do is to just drain some of the liquid that's, that's uh, surrounding this meatloaf. We want to drain it out so that the sides can just crisp up a little bit. Just tipping it straight into the water here. And we can just put this back in. And we just want to be slightly careful because it is, as you can see, it's got this lovely kind of glaze character over the top of it now. We don't want to burn it. What are we going to do with this? Well. A couple of things, a little red wine vinaigrette. And this is an optional step, you, know, you don't need to bother with this, but the nice thing about it is that it provides a little kind of tart, piquant sharpness, which can kind of cut through the meatloaf. So I've got a shallot here. You can just use a little bit of red onion or shallots, fine. Very fine dice. A little red wine vinegar, about a tablespoon or two, just over that shallot. And it's gonna macerate. In other words, it's gonna cook in that acid. Now here I've got some flat leaf parsley, and I'm just gonna take a few leaves and just keep raking it in and going over it until you've got it very finely chopped. Dijon mustard a teaspoon or so, whisk that through like this, a clove of garlic crushed with the flat of a knife, we're not going to chop this up, we're just going to pop it in, salt, most of our parsley in, keep a little bit back because it's nice to have some as a garnish, so put about, you know, three quarters of it or so in extra virgin olive oil. I'm just going to pour it in a stream as I whisk. And what we're looking for is a kind of dressing-like consistency. It doesn't want to be thick like a dip, and it doesn't want to be just runny oil. Look, you see, you get this kind of gloss here. And we can just let this sit and kind of come together. We're not going to use a lot of it. We're just going to drip a little bit on, and it's just going to provide a little burst of flavour. And I'm just going to carefully lift it out. Here we go. And we'll just pop it down on the board and let it just cool. In terms of veg, you can do whatever you like. You could do some steamed greens or, you know, whatever takes your fancy. Here's an idea, okay? So this is cheap as chips or cheap as peas. So here's a saucepan of boiling water and we're just going to chuck a bag of frozen peas in. Bring that back to the boil to just heat them through. There we go. So these are done when the water comes back to the boil and the peas start floating up to the surface of theirs as they're doing here. So we can just drain those off. Now I'm going to puree these and I've got a Vitamix and the great thing about the Vitamix is that you can puree a brick if you want to. Um, if you've got food processor that isn't quite capable of getting these very smooth, then you may have to pass them through a sieve after you've pureed them. And the other good thing about this is that it has this kind of dildo utensil that you kind of put through the top and enables you to smush whatever you're, you're pureeing down into the blades, which is really handy. So what we're going to do is we're going to put some salt in here, quite a bit of salt actually, a good load of it there, and then some ghee. 
Now, we just want a little fat. You can use butter, great. If you don't do so well with dairy, you can try ghee. Uh, if you don't do well with that, then maybe a little olive oil is gonna be good, whatever you want to use. So uh, I'm just gonna pop a couple of these chunks of ghee in. We just keep this stuff um, in pieces like this in the freezer and we use it for coffees and cooking and all sorts. What we're gonna add to this is a little dash of red wine vinegar. And what that does is it comes across the sweetness of the pea and it opens up taste buds, and it allows the sort of flavor of everything to come in. So, you know, not a load, maybe a tablespoon or two into there. Now, lid on, dildo utensil in, and I'm just gonna blend this to a smooth puree. Okay, so here we go, look. It's this wonderful, wonderful, vivid green color. Now, let's put this together. First of all, a splodge of this pea. Now, if I was doing this day to day, I would just spoon it into a bowl and chuck the meatloaf on top. But because we're making a video, let's ironically try and make meatloaf look posh. So what we do is just take a spoon of our pea puree, dunk it on there and splurge it across. Put that on like this. And we can do another one maybe. Pop it on. Here we go. And what we'll do is just give this another quick whisk round just to sort of incorporate it a little bit. And we literally just want a little kind of, a little kind of drip of this across here. A few little dots of it around the place. Fresh parsley that we left and scatter it over. And there we go. Look, we've got a pretty elegant looking meatloaf dish. It's cheap as chips, it's totally delicious. Give it a go, take a picture, stick it on Instagram, tag me at Ruston's Boneyard. Love to get to know you, love to see what's going on in your kitchen. For now, keep cooking.